euh, d'une façon très, très passionnée et stimulante, je pense. Et là, euh, donc, le, nous avons proposé à Luc Delahé de, de, de prendre un moment après déjeuner. Donc là, c'est la, la partie de la matinée plutôt consacrée à des, à des questions, à des discussions, s'il y a lieu, parce que c'est... Ce n'est pas, pas une obligation, donc j'ai... Moi, je voudrais juste faire une remarque, mais je, je ne sais pas si elle si est pertinente à, à propos de la, de la notion de presentness. presentness. Je, je, tu, tu as dit que tu voulais préférer éviter présence. Et je, je pensais encore une fois à Louis Marin, qui était dans une famille commune, qui a repris la, la, la théorie de l'énonciation de Mandrénis et ces deux dimensions qui sont celles de la transparence et de l'opacité. Et il avait l'habitude de dire une phrase qui a l'air très simple mais qui n'est pas comme souvent lui, en fait très complexe. Et chaque euh, représentation se présente en présentant quelque chose. Mm -hmm. Chaque représentation se présente en représentant quelque chose. Et cette cette partie-là de se présente, qui est peut-être présente, c'est-à-dire cette dimension de se, de se, de se tenir devant. Qui a une manifestation. Et, oui, une manifestation. Alors, euh, il a développé, Marin, tout, une, tout un travail sur les, la façon de l'art classique, l'art de Poussin, par exemple, mais plutôt euh, l'aventure italienne de la Renaissance. Euh, développe des stratégies pour euh, faire euh, disparaître la dimension de la présentation. Hein, un, 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 par exemple, en creusant l'espace et en euh, mettant entre parenthèses la, la dimension matérielle de, de la toile. Alors pour moi, pour un certain nombre d'entre nous, c'est un, un, un modèle intéressant parce qu'il n'est il est pas... Il est, il n'est pas figé, c'est-à-dire il y a toujours une tension entre ces deux dimensions qui sont toujours présentes. Il n'y a pas des, des, des œuvres qui seraient uniquement euh, opaques ou des, des œuvres qui seraient uniquement euh, transparentes. Et je pense que lui, Marin, était aussi sensible, à, même s'il n'a pas beaucoup écrit sur l'art la, sur la, abstrait, la, il a écrit quand même quelques textes et qu'il était tout à fait sensible à cette opacification euh, qui est celle de la, de la peinture all over. Il a, il a un très beau texte au prologue qui est dans, dans, les, dans, les, dans les cahiers du Musée national d'art moderne. Et ce qui est important, je pense, dans cette couple transparence, opacité, ou présentation, euh, euh, pour Marin, c'est tous ces... ces ce qui fait tenir, ce qui fait tenir euh, le tableau, notamment tous ces, tous ces, ces études sur le cadre, que, que pour lui n'est pas seulement le cadre physique, mais c'est tout ce qui est de l'ordre, tout, ce tout ce qui soutient, et dans un, dans un, dans un certain cas, le, cette dimension va jusqu'à inclure le, le musée, l'institution muséale, qui, qui est aussi une partie de la de l'appareil de présentation de l'œuvre. Et donc, je voulais juste te demander si cette dimension marinienne de l'opacité n'est pas proche de, de la présence. Oui, il probablement est. Je veux dire, c'est très helpful, très intéressant. Et bien sûr, ce que je parle ici, c'est, je veux dire, ce qui se sent un peu différent, is that in Louis' account, uh, these are always two poles that are always present, and that, that's true. And what, what I'm talking about is that with the emergence of a certain modernity, a certain modernism, you could say that that whole dimension of, you know, as it were, opacité, but of, of this pressure, right? it, it's, 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 I suppose what I'm not finding in the notion of opacité or that, yeah, is the insistence of, uh, you know, in other words, it's not just, let us say, a kind of thematization, thematization, 
de l'opacité. It's actually something you know, so active, you know, what, what, what the Manet generation called, you know, frappé, and it's, it's energetic, more something energetic. more energetic, something very, very active, and so that would be, but, but again, since we, Louis would have no problem with that, you know, this would be a, a, a petit ajustement <laughs> to the theory. Um, no, that's great. For Giovanni and me, uh, Louis Marin is toujours present, yeah, yeah, for toujours. Yeah. It's a, 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 a great uh, uh, theorist and a great uh, critic and historian and a, a great man. So it's a, a pleasure to speak of him. Say a little bit more. I mean, it's it's not easy. I mean, if you're saying, well, how how does how do I how does the light box function? I think it's very. Um, it's not easy to say. It's not easy to say, uh, and to some extent, it varies from picture to picture. Um, for me, it was uh, like a, a bit of a shock right, seeing the first light boxes. Didn't know what to think. Um, and it's interesting, I think, as Jeff Wall, in recent years, he, he, he has continued to make light box, but he's, I think he's moving more away from it and more towards you know, opaque photographs. Black and white, of course, always for him opaque, but color too now, increasingly. Um, so, on the one hand, you get this kind of space, which is what you're saying. On the other hand, the light itself kind of pushes the image, you know, forward. You have the sense of the light coming like that. Um, and then the other thing that Jeff has always done, um, as Luke knows very well, is especially when the, when the photographs have any size, he joins it, two transparencies together to make the big in, image. And he lets, the, he lets the join show, right? You see this thin line of the join. And on the one hand, this is something that uh, sometimes troubles people. They wish he didn't do that. Uh, he likes it. And I think one of the things he likes about it is that it's a way of <coughs> quietly announcing the surface of the photograph, you know? This, I mean, part of the problem that, or part of the issue for photography has always been what has been called the transparency of the photographic surface, right? It's always been, like traditionally for photography, a question of, I mean, unlike painting, which is a worked surface and which has no problem in thematizing the surface through the touches of the paint, photography has always had a more, a different sort of relation to the fact of its material surface, right? And one way in which that has been described is photograph is transparent. You look into it. Of course there's a surface, and the surface can have a very different character from one photographer to the next. So say someone like Patrick Fagenbaum now, we were hoping that he could come here, works with surfaces characteristically that are very, very matte, not glossy, and sometimes just exposed nakedly so you feel the surface of the photograph. 
Um, but Jeff with the light box is making photographs where you don't really feel the surface at all. You're just aware of it. And it's, it's not just transparent, as it were metaphorically, it's really completely transparent. And that's, that's just been one of the things he's worked with, but that's also, I think, one reason why he has been more than willing to accept this line of division that also declares something about the surface. I'm not really answering your question. I don't, you know, it's, it, I don't have a simple answer to, yes, it works like this. And, um, and there are photographs that would seem to me that go over into a kind of theatricality, through a kind of excess. Right? There's a picture called The Vampire's Picnic. There are certain modes of the way Wall has worked at different times that I don't like as much as other works. I'm, I'm particularly attracted to the work that Wall has been doing in the last more than 10 years. I mean, that was what, 92, 93, say the last 15, 16 years, in a direction that he calls near documentary, where it's like what he says about the Adrian Walker. This wasn't a candid photograph. This wasn't something that was really <coughs> happening. But it was something that did really happen. And I've restaged it in a way so that it could look like what it must have looked like when it was really happening. And, he, and Wall's term for this is near documentary. This also relates to a series of ideas what Giovanni mentioned very quickly before. Um, in English, the everyday. So in French, it would be quotidien. Right? And that, become, that has become of, of enormous interest to Wall. Um, so this is, this is a, a non-answer to your, your question. I, I had the same, not the same question, but somehow the feeling that uh, this question of, this, of the light box and of the surface has been uh, important or surely important to me the first time I saw a light box. I saw the first time a light box in 87 in Documenta, it was a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And uh, storyteller, in my memory, it's about five meters, but it should be three meters. It's a big. Sh surely not five meters. But I have a m memory, something very big, and uh, this, this impression about the surface, it's something that's really coming out of the picture. I have to say in these years, uh, I, I, I mean in your, in your way to, to, to bring us to the, the question about photography, you, you're coming from the question of, of subjectivity of the spectator, it's a whole uh, only presence, and something that should be not only a presence. You're coming to photography directly. In my, in my experience, uh, this question about minimal art uh, has come through uh, different issues. And in the 80s, uh, as I began to work, the question of, of what is subjectivity was a quite important question. Uh, let's say, I, at the time I was working on space mostly, and the question about space was that uh, the experience of space, uh, of subjectivity in space, of the body in the space, uh, could not be so easily uh, ranged as minimal art uh, had done it. And it was to me clear that the question of uh, experience is not only a question of body and presence, but also a question of memory, of stratification of experience, and so uh, the question of image somehow. But I couldn't say it at this time. I couldn't explain it. It was something that it was present to me, but not conscious. In the, as I saw for the first time Jeff Wall in, in Castle, not in a book but in real, um, it, had, it was a shock to me because this surface was a surface in which, on which the, the image has been arrested. <coughs> so that the question you posing uh, about behind and in front of the picture, which is the, which is the direction, where is the front of the picture? was very present physically. Let's say that the, this light that is pushing from behind is also emphasizing the space behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, also 
the very political way of bringing these light boxes, it's, it was something that was done in the publicity in the, mm -hmm. in, in the street, mm -hmm. uh, into a, a closed space, changed very much this uh, force of light. Mm -hmm. But it was a very aggressive, somehow, mm -hmm. light. So this spice behind was coming out, so I agree very much with this. But the photography was also, to me, a surface that brought to me in memory the, the theories of um, uh, Les Danseurs de Barras. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know the, the theories that von Schlem, uh, Schlem had brought very much, uh, or draw very much uh, example for his, for his lessons mm -hmm. in Barras. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the important theory of, of uh, Schlemmer was that the question of art is like a, a surface that is arresting something that is in front of you, mm -hmm. but also behind you. Mm -hmm. And I was very much thinking about those things, mm -hmm. in, in questioning about experience. Mm -hmm. So that experience is not only something that is in front at the moment, but also something that is behind, mm -hmm. in another space. Mm -hmm. And the photographs of Jeff Wall, for the first time, to me, brought two things. The possibility to arrest something in the middle mm -hmm. of these two spaces. Mm -hmm. And in the second question, something that was absolutely absent, absent in, the, in, the, in the art world at this time, mm -hmm. that's the body, mm -hmm. the figure. It was in a castle in which, in, in the same time, you had a very new, uh, new outcoming uh, form of art that was the work of Thomas Schütte, mm -hmm. Mucha, Günther Ferg, Ludger Gerdes. Mm -hmm. uh, this other uh, part of the of the school in Düsseldorf, it's mm -hmm. the same school. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, yeah. It's the same school. And, the, and this other kind of work that was modernization, reduction, spaces that are not dealing with your body in the space, but your body is out of the space. So it is something that is reduced, something that pushes you out of the space. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the same years I saw, I was working with a gallery in Liaruma in Naples, and then there was a mucha, the, bo the, the boxes of mucha with the empty space, mm -hmm. and, and the glass, mm -hmm. and the door glass. And at the same time, the photographs of the cities of Stuttgart. Mm -hmm. It's the same exhibition. Mm -hmm. And this is... Uh, I think an important point to me mm -hmm. to understand why photography becomes important at this point. Mm -hmm. Because this distanciation about the question of the body in the space was also experimented in, in a sculpture work. In something that is abstraction, an abstract work, the body inside, the body outside, the composition of what is in the middle, how do you deal mm -hmm. with the object that's not more an object mm -hmm. because it's a function. When it becomes a model, the artwork becomes a function. And this was a, a, a quite new invention in art mm -hmm. that was uh, very uh, hardly against this question of uh, merely physical work, a merely mm -hmm. experiential mm -hmm. work. So it's very interesting for me personally also to see that Thomas Schütte came to the figure very quickly in mm -hmm. the middle of the 80s. And so uh, we came back to something that is representation in art that was excluded from minimal, from before minimal, mm -hmm. from the second world mm -hmm. on to our days. Mm -hmm. So I have the impression that this question of photography <coughs> is something also that deals with this question of space in art generally. Mm -hmm. So I agree very much with what mm -hmm. you say. But also something else that is that, that the figure is coming back mm -hmm. through photography. Mm -hmm. And this is. Uh, it's very important in art history, uh, in the modern art history, because at the end of the Second World, we have no more figures. Human figures. Human figures, yes. Human bodies. Mm -hmm. And then we have Jeff Wall, and we have uh, Thomas Schütt, and we have Ludger uh, Gerdes, mm -hmm. also, or some, some other artists, that, or Mucha with these empty boxes, it's a figure, it's an empty figure. Mm -hmm. It's an emptiness of a body, mm -hmm. brought back the body. So I think that the question you posed yesterday about the self representation, body, and are very linked to this question because photography has also something to do 
there's a possibility to have a body in front of me mm -hmm. and the sign not in front of me, mm -hmm. in temporality that I mm -hmm. am not uh, considerable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it doesn't coincide. It doesn't coincide. Yeah. No, I think there's, you know, the whole issues of body are very tricky, right? Because, you know, even you think of that caro, uh, that abstract caro, but it's also intensely bodily. You know, you, you, when you look at, if you look at that, the early British critics, when they wrote about caro's abstraction, because they couldn't see abstract, they couldn't see. They'd say, well, it's all about uh, industrial materials. Mm. You know, it's about making art out of industrial steel. Carol, it isn't about that at all. Um, and it's very much a sculpture that you have to feel your way into the bodily relations. You know, it's only by virtue of being an embodied person that you can appreciate, say, what that eye beam segment is doing. Mm. It's not that it's a it's not that it's a surrogate for somebody, but the, it's the, the, all the movement is movement that you feel because you have a body. And then minimalism does its own thing with the body. So there's a way in which the body has been there in different forms, and then, as you say, there's a moment where it starts, you know, appearing uh, in propria persona, you know. Um, so, but it's the, the, you know, the body is, is very, in, 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 and it's there, you know, in its own way, it's there in Sarah, right, always, right? The, 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 the idea of trying to impose on us and make things that could crush our bodies and so on. So it's just, but I think you're right that photography brings it back in a certain way, but it's never been really a way. It's not, it was never, you know, just flat Morris gone. Hmm? Morris in writes about yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. No, it's important for... And, you know, look, the uh, die, right, the, the Tony Smith, it's a six-foot cube. And someone says, says, you know, why did you make it a six-foot cube? He said, well, if it was smaller, it would be just a little object. And if it, would big, it was bigger, it would be a monument. <laughs> but, you know, six foot, <laughs> this is not an innocent dimension. Yes. You know, it's, it's an abstract person in a certain way, you know. Um, it's, it, and the hollowness of the cube is to suggest something like a, a kind of inner subjectivity. I mean, I don't like that form of bodiliness or the, the, the allusion to a subjectivity. I don't like the minimal version of it. But it's not that it isn't there. Um, so yes, I think it works through all of this. It seems to me also that this question of temporality is very important. That the, the, like in the model of Thomas Schrift or mm -hmm. Gerdes, you have a you have a distance, so you are not in the model. Mm -hmm. you, you have to keep out to see. Yeah. Thinking about being inside. Yeah. And photographists are doing in the same years something very important that in a several in a quite similar yeah. way. That's fascinating. Luke, can you get me back into this? <coughs> yes, I have to. Yeah. Let me see what I can. Uh, just, uh, I want to go to Google Image. Yeah. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Let me just see if I can. Uh, for example. Let me uh, let me see if I can. Okay, so this is a, a carol from uh, 1966-67. Right? It's called The Window. And it's, it's, uh, it's steel, painted kind of dark green. And 
the whole point of this sculpture, you know, is that we we don't go in there. We don't go in there. We're, we, we, we stay outside. It's as if one of the things sometimes Carol wants to do is make a sculpture that would be like about being in something. But for him already, then you would say the rule of abstraction is you don't go in. You know, that you stay out. So even in this high modernist moment, mm -hmm. the idea of a certain kind of distance was, was, it was is very basic. And this is this is a you know perfect example. Or if I show you, uh, you know, it's one of the things I wrote about during these years when I wrote about Carol, how you had to stay out. Definitely not. <laughs> that was giving me deep. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, doesn't that I mean? If you put it all into Gimel. Let me try one other. Uh, oh, into, I see what you're saying. Put that up. Let's see, where, where are the... Maybe it's it's a, it's, a, it's the French it's the French keyboard then. Yeah. Doesn't matter. It's the same. It's the same, same. point. Okay. It's the same point. It's not important. Yeah. Don't worry. Okay. We'll just see. Nope. 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 No way. <laughs> no, no way. So, but also just in terms of the body, this is a, oh, well, doesn't, <laughs> forget it, doesn't, doesn't matter. Well, okay. So let's forget this. Um, yes, uh, I mean, certainly that is something, you know, that the, that the photography does. I, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in a lot of your comments Concern, concern these issues of temporality, which is extremely interesting to me, and which I haven't thought of that much in relation to photography. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very important to me thinking of the Caravaggio, mm -hmm. um, but I haven't thought about it in, in the same way in relation to uh, the, the photography. Uh, other questions, comments people have? So this one is, uh, uh, yeah. Yes, that's commercial context and, yes. uh, and how his uh, composition was going very much and very far back to painting history. Yes. At the same time, introducing problems which were at that time in uh, Colombia, in, uh, in uh, around British Columbia or in, in Canada, um, uh, issues like uh, colonialism and what was uh, how how people dealt with that at that time. Yeah. I agree. Um, I tend myself always to be less interested in those issues in some ways than uh, in the other kinds of things. Um, because there's so much writing always about that. But, you know, for example, I think a terrific photograph. Right, this is Jeff Wall's uh, Mimic, uh, 1981. Um, it's, it's Vancouver. And we see this Asian guy walking towards us. And then this, a 
can you say, sort of lumpen proletariat couple um, walking up, and the, and the guy is making a gesture, you know, of a, of a slant eye, you know, at the, at the Asian guy. That's what the picture is about. Right? So it's a picture about, you know, as kind of racism. I mean, this is, this would be a picture with a, you know, it, you, you see it in a way how complicated Wall's ambitions are because it's a bunch of things. It's, it's, it's a picture that's trying to use a, a subject that comes out of the everyday political reality of Vancouver at that moment. At the same time, there's this desire that Wall has to find a way to make a street photograph. You know, at a moment in 1981 where it looks like the heyday of street photography, let's say, to take a single emblematic figure, the American photographer Gary Winogrand, who thrives during the 1960s and early 70s, there's a way in which street photography seems to be over as a very attractive option for younger photographers. And so Wall, that's immediately going to be a challenge for Wall to try to figure out how to make a version of the street photograph. And we get, we get this. Now, the other thing that's fascinating, and I would not, wouldn't know this just from the photograph, but Wall gives an interview about this picture. And he talks about the gesture that the guy is making with his eye. And you, again, you have to remember that a photograph like this, God knows how long Wall would have worked on it. You know, he'd have, he'd have gotten these people, he would have auditioned for these people, he would have looked for the right people. He would have, uh, you know, he would have had to decide on what they were wearing. I'm sure he would have had that guy and that girl wear things that they normally wore to be, to be really comfortable. But he, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he took this it, you know, if it took a week of shooting to get what he wanted here, and I'm sure there was computer work, right? And the way Wall works, it could be that that guy and that girl and that man were never in the same photograph in exactly the same way. You know, he, he could have been, I don't know whether this is, but it's possible. I don't think in 81. 81 With the computer? You don't think he's in for the computer? Yeah, you're probably right. But he certainly would have done a lot of, I mean, a lot of photographing to get this. And then Wall says this, um, to me, very interesting thing. He says, he thinks of this gesture as being what he calls a kind of micro gesture that the guy would have done, as it were, without even knowing that he was doing it, and that he would also have done it so fast that it would be almost invisible. So as if the guy, even the guy doing the gesture, wouldn't, wouldn't even know he was doing the gesture. And we feel that the other guy doesn't see it, and she doesn't seem to see it. And Wall's idea was it would be so quick that you almost couldn't see it, but the camera sees it. You know? Now, I, want, I, I don't want to say that that's necessarily in the photograph. Do you know what I mean? I mean, imagine Wall didn't say that. Imagine Wall didn't say that. And imagine somebody here said, well, I think of that gesture as an automatic gesture that's made so quickly that the guy doesn't even know he's making it. You, know, you would say, well, I, you may be right. I mean, I, that's an interesting thing to say, but you could never prove that, right? You could. I don't think it would even occur to someone to say, but for Jeff, that's an important part of this. And what interests me about that is it shows how even in a photograph like this, there is in his mind, along with the political, along with everything else, something you, again, could call anti-theatrical. I mean, the idea that he wants to imagine this gesture as being made almost without this guy even knowing that he's doing it and of it being so instantaneous that you almost can't see it, is to imagine a dimension of this photograph that is uh, like almost on the side of invisibility, you know, as against manifestation. 
So this is, I, I'm not at all disagreeing with what you're saying, but I'm saying that even in the heart of a photograph that is as programmatically political as this photograph is, as pro programmatically social as this photograph is, there is for Wall always something else which is involved with the kinds of issues I've been talking about, the relation to the viewer understood not primarily as a political being and so on. With Jeff, there's, there's always this double consciousness, even at his most but political. That's why, exactly, that's why I remain on this formal side. Mm -hmm. I was speaking more about uh, the fluorescent light. Yeah, the fluorescent, no, that's and, perfectly. And the size and uh, the composition. Because yes. I think it's a lot about, uh, in the end, even though it's not uh, maybe a, it's too popular maybe it has become, but it's, it's in the end it's about picture. It's about picturesque and about uh, painting. The context of pic picture as a, as a big thing and uh, as the main <coughs> source of information and, and uh, kind of uh, education of, uh, of people who visit museums. And that fact that he brought these light boxes the light boxes which you usually see in the street as adverts yeah. in the gallery that's already, I think, a very... Yeah, no, I agree. <coughs> yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, certainly at the beginning, that was very striking. I, I, I don't, dis I'm, I'm not, I'm no, not saying I, this. I, I don't want to somehow, you know, uh, speak under someone. I just introduce another side. Yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be. But also, I think also this side of the problem is, uh, I don't know if it is so evident and so quickly directly, let's say directly, a transposition from the advertising world into the art world. But that's because how he felt inspired, he says himself. Yes, he said it's said, but I think in the same years as, uh, as the world was uh, shooting this picture, Rodney Graham did a, did a piece also in, in Vancouver, that is the, uh, the river, you know the, this piece? It's a film? No. It is a, no. a generator. Mm -hmm. oh, no, it is a film. Mm -hmm. a, you have a a camera, a fixed camera, filming mm -hmm. in 72 millimeters, mm -hmm. big, uh, mm -hmm. huge quality. It's filming a river uh, with uh, uh, with a cinema lamp, the big lamps, uh, uh, lightning and at night, uh, mm -hmm. falling of night, uh, the river, and you have a big uh, generator that is creating the energy for the lamp. <coughs> and so the, the generator is quite under the camera and you are seeing this water making a big noise mm -hmm. and you're hearing the big noise of the generator. Mm -hmm. um, I knew of these pictures at the time in the 80s, so I think it's, it, it's the middle of the 80s, I think it's 84. At this time, uh, Rodney Graham did an exposition with uh, Jeff Wallace and, and uh, Jeff Paul. So it was a group of persons walking strictly together in a gallery, and the piece of Rodney Graham was the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked the gallery, uh, the gallerists, uh, it's a problem to, to, to project it, what's the problem? And he said me, no, if you want, we, we can go to see it in the cinema, there's no problem, I will show you if someone wants to see it. Mm -hmm. But Rodney Graham wants to, to expose the film, the, only mm -hmm. the, the film. Yeah. 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 And so I saw the film much later, I saw it only on catalogs. Mm -hmm. And it's only in the end of the 90s that for the first time I saw the projection of the film. And this seems to me very important because uh, the question of light and surface, of uh, of materiality, of political issues, what mean it to, to take a film. What Rodney Gam was saying in these years was that the film was being shooting, shooted like a film in the in the thirties. Like films about adventure uh, and people uh, making films in the in the far uh, in far country with very dangerous uh, um, very dangerous uh, works like with very people dying to make a film about uh, conquer uh, the West or something like this. This was the inspiring material. And so he did like in these years 
this big walk to, 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 to light the, the, uh, the, the river, and then at the end we have only the materiality of the film. And these political issues, you see, the, what I want to say is that there is a very strong political issue to deplace, to replace some, uh, some tools, some materials, some sensible uh, surfaces, uh, transparent surfaces, lighting as energy, lighting as, as, uh, as noise, but at the same time to deplace it in a complicated way with a very big distance. So you don't experiment this. And this is to me, I think, a very important yeah, issue. I wasn't resisting on that. I mean, no, I mean, you know, that, that's I wasn't what. Resisting that political uh, side is, uh, is the most uh, obvious or the most. Uh, yes, but obvious. also you, in Jeffrey, you don't see that the first thing is also somewhere you, you make a step back when you see the light box. Yeah, you know, you, you don't feel it that it's so easily taken from outside to inside. You feel at the beginning that there is something more complicated. Like in this film of, of Rodney Gar, you don't experiment it. And you have to, to, to make a big uh, to, um, um, investment of, of energy and of thinking to get the piece. And in Jeff Ward's pieces also you have this kind of experience that the light box is not at its place. But you don't know why. You, you, you see what I mean? It's not so evident politically. Of course. But that's the best side of it. Yes, sure. <laughs> yes, we agree. Because now I think, you know, I became this guy who insists that it's political. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no I agree. I'm not, uh, not uh, interested in that. It's just that I wanted to introduce the subject. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's it. Yeah, sure. Because going back to meaning, mm. maybe we should not separate uh, the political and the theatrical yeah. issue. It, it, uh, if you said, Michael, that gesture is so automatic that the, the results of, of, of seeing that is to perceive the gesture as mechanical. This is political mm -hmm. in itself. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's so it's so yeah so deep in its nature. Uh, mm -hmm. assumed. Mm -hmm. So po politics is not in the scene only in, mm -hmm. in, in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the more explicit Yes, yes. Maybe politics is also inside the way in which anti theatrical. Yeah, I think Jeff would like that. Yes. Questions in fact, curiosity about your opinion about two artists which are on the other side of your story you told us. Uh, uh, for for uh, uh, abstraction, uh, uh, what do you think about Adrianos? Adrianos. Uh, Ad Reinhardt? Yes. In one hand, and maybe if I finish, uh, about photography and embodiment, about Cindy Sherman. Uh, just have to have your, your opinion about. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you want that. Ad Reinhardt and Cindy Sherman. So. Very interesting. Let's take Cindy Sherman first. Okay. So by the time Cindy Sherman is doing stuff like this, I think it's complete bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> I think she's I think she's lost. Okay. I, oh, reserve of energy. Huh? This little thing she's Yeah, we're not getting a light there. So the Cindy Sherman that interests me 
is, you know, the, the early... You know, I think the untitled film stills at the beginning are brilliant and interesting. In the, my book, I try to claim them for my kind of issues against the postmodernist reading of those. Because I think what she's, I, I mean, I won't try to go into it. So I, I, I'm, I, I'm I, I, for me, she's not some kind of great, great figure. But I'm, I'm interested in the early Cindy Sherman that um, And I even, yeah, so this, I think these have something, you know, quite brilliant about them. And I think they bear a very complicated relation to the kinds of issues we're talking about. <coughs> Movies, stills, um, but not at all about some kind of acknowledging of the viewer. I mean, it's, it, they're complicated works. By the time she does the more, you know, all the hopped up things, I think these are of no interest whatsoever, artistically. You know, I just think... But they're working very well with Appenstein. With a, yeah, uh, yes, that's true. <laughs> works very well. <laughs> so I'm, I, I, I'm, I am Interested in Sherman, okay, so this is another of the film stills, as you know. That's another of the film stills. Mm -hmm. But then this whole, that's one of the film stills. When, when she moves to this, these elaborate, um, construct, I'm, I'm, I'm just a complete non-believer. So I think she gets lost. I think the, er the early work is brilliant. You know, that's one of the film stills, that's a film still, that's a film still. But I think she gets completely uh, derooted. She doesn't know what to do, and all she can do is go into this increasingly, I almost want to say, you know, theatral mode. You know, <laughs> there's a little Caravaggio. <laughs> Great. Um, Ad Reinhardt, do you all know who, are you all familiar with Reinhardt? It's, I don't know what this is going to look like. I don't think I saw real ones, but uh, I saw just a production. Hmm? I don't saw real ones, uh, that's... Uh, I'm sorry. I never saw real ones. Oh, you never saw a real Reinhardt. Reinhardt. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a pity. <laughs> I don't know if that's that's interesting. So, this is basically what a Reinhardt looks like, right? I mean... So he's a, can you see that there's a kind of dot, a cross in that at all? Can you make it out? Yes. I mean, there's a, there's a bluish vertical that's crossed by a more dark grayish horizontal and all of this taking place in a kind of black field. So, yeah, can, well, you really can't see, but, but that's sort of what it's like if we really had the picture here. It, he's, he's painting, the famous Reinhardts are in this, they're black paintings. They're black paintings with some kind of geometrical, generally cruciform structure, and all very, very, very close to black. And for him, these were, I mean, he, he saw his own position as being a very pure art position. For me, the trouble with these pictures all the way is that they have almost no uh, material realization. The surface, he keeps the surface very uh, matte, but very, it's, it's so smooth that they, they just aren't, they aren't in a way physical enough. 
They aren't. So I don't love Ad Reinhardt. I think it's a kind of very intelligent and interesting painting. But it never, for me, as a painting, it always is more of an idea than a painting. It's, it's, it's like a, it, he doesn't mean it to be a conceptual work. But it's as if the works are ultimately more conceptual than they are actual when you're standing in front of them. That, but that's for me. You know, there are people who are devoted to Reinhardt, right, who just love the painting. I, I, I don't. Um, I respect it. I respect the uh, attempt. But I don't think they achieve the kind of physical presence that's necessary right, for, for the painting to really succeed. So, but that's just, you know, as Clement Greenberg used to say, don't take my word for it. <laughs> he once said that to Princess Margaret. The Carol had a big retrospective in England in 1969, and Princess Margaret came to the opening, and because it was the heyday of you know kind of swinging London, and. Uh, so she, uh, she, she talked briefly to Caro, and then Clement Greenberg was there, and she wanted to go through the exhibition with him. And at some point or other, Greenberg said in his very characteristic way, he said something, and then he said, but don't take my word for it. And she said, oh, Mr. Greenberg, I would never dream of doing that. <laughs> so. Anything else? So I'm just showing you here, to close the morning, I'm showing you a painting from the 1960s by the American painter Jules Olitsky, who is, a, is painting using spray guns with acrylic. Right? And uh, he's a, another painter who I would admire enormously, Greenberg admired. And this is, and it's very, very dense color painting. And there is no painting in the world now that is more proscribed. It's under house arrest, okay? This is, these, this is not allowed to hang in any museum. <laughs> Um, these, this is, you're not supposed to even know about it. This is, this is for the entire art world, the, the complete enemy, right? So is Morris Lewis, so is Greenberg, so is, you know, the, the, what was called color field painting in general. But Olitsky is the most hated, the most despised. There's this honest to God fear that if Olitsky is recognized, then there's no way of controlling the situation anymore. <laughs> then it may be that, like, real art returns. So Olitsky is uh, the great, the, he's, he's he really, he's like, I don't know, like the years when Mandela was on Robin's Island, you know? <laughs> he's just, he's supposed to just stay there forever. So I can't resist just showing you this. <laughs> okay.